Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, the blues, Belushi, and beyond with legendary drummer and percussionist, Tony Bronigal. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everybody out there in podcast land? Yep, you're right. It's another, it's that time. It's time for an exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. We talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And as always, I have a friend joining me today, highly accomplished person, Grammy award-winning drummer and producer, also writes songs. He's an actor living in Los Angeles, played with folks like Eric Burden, Taj Mahal, Bonnie Raitt, Robert Cray, Jim Belushi, and many others. Our friend, Tony Bronigal. What is up, my friend? Hey, Rich, how you doing, man? It's good to hear your voice and good to see you, you know. Great to see you. Yeah, man. Um, It has been a while. You joined me. I think I got to know you probably starting about eight or nine years ago. And in 2016, I did a drummer's week in Los Angeles and I had folks like Blair Senta and Jimmy Paxson join us and talk to the kids about a life in music. And you were in the mix there and dropped some serious like gems, like just brain droppings for the kids. They're probably still thinking about this stuff, about how to make a living in this crazy (laughs) business that we call the music business. And, you know, you're a survivor. I'm a survivor at this point. You're a survivor at this. We're the designated survivors. Um, you know, we keep growing and changing and evolving, but you're just at the heart of it. You know, you're a funky drummer, man. You mix the funk, you mix the R and B, you mix the blues, you mix the rock and roll and the New Orleanian thing, and you have this thing all of your own that's very inspirational, not only to me and drummers coming up, but all the people that you make music with, man. So, congratulations on a life in music, man. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's like. You don't really think about all that, what you just said, you know, when you're doing or when you first get into it and when you're doing it, you don't realize that it's going to get to this cross, not even a crossroad, but this place of development where it, it's all of the, the richness of what you've played from everybody you played with, what you've learned, what you pick up, what the old guy told you, what the young guy taught you, what the whomever you learn from wherever and you stop for a moment and look at something and checked it out and went, oh, that is cool. And then you take the time to actually walk through it and learn it and then it becomes something that you do and then it just it goes in your back pocket or wherever you file it away and you keep using it and using it and using it and you know you go to a studio and a guy puts up a microphone a certain way and you hit a drum a certain way and it sounds and you go oh i get that oh yeah the the transients are all there oh now if i do that that can help how i affect how i play or i have to affect it by playing a certain way and you get all these crazy little lessons that that you and I take for granted. And when, <clears throat> it's like when you had that, that, that weekend that we, you know, I hung out at, you listen to everybody there all have different richness, uh, different levels of richness with, you know, Rich, Rich Redmond is. Um, uh, different richness of, of, uh, of experiences and, 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 and things in philosophy and things to say about all these, all the stuff that we talk about. And I can get into, you know, Occasionally when I teach somebody and somebody asks me a question about it, I, t- I think it's a really simple elementary thing that they're asking me. And I go, oh, oh, you want to know about that? Oh, that, I, I, you, th- you think people take a lot of things for granted? Yeah. Or you take for granted that a lot of people already know. And you don't. And you sit and you show somebody that already knows how to play something really simple about a nuance or how you put and move something and switch between swing and straight or keep it in the middle or whatever. And it's amazing that the stuff that you learn yourself about yourself while you're doing this. Yes. You know, and, and, and it's uh, to me, a uh, purpose in life is, <clears throat> you know, I'm of an age where I, I've done quite a bit and, and yeah. I'm not patting myself on the back, but if, if this is all I get, then I'm still okay. But I'm, I'm not done and I don't want to garden and golf only, you know what I mean? I want to be, keep going and, and, and keep being as long as something meaningful is happening. And, and that's my new motto is to be doing things that are meaningful in life right now. Be coming out of the pandemic and everything, Absolutely. you know, I went, wow, we survived that. This is crazy. Uh, off camera, we were talking just before we uh, 
pressed record about. I was like, how was your zombie apocalypse? And, you know, some people, you know, made sourdough and, and got fat and you were, you know, you were watching your diet and working out and playing the drums yeah. and staying sharp. Yeah. And, and um, I, you know, I did a similar thing. I've always been a runner. Um, along the way, I probably, you know, I started introducing like, you know, cross training type stuff and boot camp. Type, you know, I go to Barry's, or I'll go to Orange Theory. Like you got you come out of the Thanksgiving season. You're like, what's that? I got to take care of that. And, you you know, you sign up for Orange Theory for a month and you burn it off. Yeah. Um, but then during the pandemic, I rediscovered running. I mean, like Forrest Gump, I ran and ran and ran all over. I know every nook and cranny of West Hollywood and Beverly Hills. I just pretended wow. that. Um, zombies were chasing me and I, I was running six miles a day and I totally kind of wow. reshaped, yeah, I reshaped my body. I got, I developed, I rediscovered a new joy, uh, a joy that I had in my life. And now it's like, I have not stopped. And so without fail, I get out there and I just put that strain on my, uh, on my knees every day that I'm sure late in life I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pay for, but you know, it yeah. just, you know, it's great because it, it, it make you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm so glad I put myself first today like i put myself first i took care of that thing sure, and now sure. i can give my best to everyone else <laughs> well you know I, it, you, you have to keep this this as a drummer we just have to keep this together we don't yeah. keep this frame and these muscles and yeah. hands and i lift weights only for circulation i do not lift weights to get any for you know some guys crank because they want to get big. I don't yeah. want to get big. I don't lift weights for that. Yeah. I just lift some lift weights enough so that when I'm playing drums, I don't get tired. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be able to, uh, to, and I'm, I'm, I'm into limberness even more than weights. Are you, are you a little bit of a yogi? Yeah. Do yeah. You, I do yoga. I've done yoga for 25 or 30 years. So. Every day or like a couple times a week or no, no, no. A couple of days a week I'll do yoga, but I I'm a bicyclist, you know, so oh, I like yeah. to ride. I rode, I rode this morning. I don't ride long, long, long distances, but I'll go out and crank it up a couple of hills and down a few hills and ride, you know, a short ride will be five or six miles and then a long ride will be 10 or 12 miles, you know? So then I stay off of the busy streets because we've got bike lane streets here. And then I, I hit a lot of neighborhoods and I kind of go from through a neighborhood over to another busy street, cross it. And then, I mean, the other day, like I rode, I had my backpack on and I rode to the grocery store, grabbed some things and my prescriptions. And then I went down to the hardware store and grabbed a brush and the thingy. And I put it all on my backpack. Then I went out to a vitamin store that I like, which is another two, two miles on my bike, you know, in a bottle of water. And I got the vitamins. I want. Then I went over to North Hollywood and, and uh, had some glasses fixed. Everything and I got home and it's like a ten or twelve mile ride and Dude. I ran all my errands and I didn't ride I didn't drive in the car I didn't you know now but, is your grocery uh, store the um, Ralph's on Coldwater and Ventura is that your that's grocery one store of, that's yeah. that's one of that's my closest yes yeah, exactly yeah. well yeah, I, I'm, I, right, I I'm right I'm right close to Laurel and Ventura Laurel Canyon when it comes over to Ventura I'm right there in that little. Uh, they call it the Silver Triangle. I'm just west and south. The restaurant capital of the world right there on Ventura Boulevard. <laughs> what do you want to eat? People come over and go, I'm hungry. I go, what do you want to eat? Well, what do you got? I go, everything. <laughs> We've got Ethiopian all the way to <laughs> vegan and everything in between. Correct. And Chinese and Thai and Indian yep. and, you know, and sushi and Mexican and steakhouse and seafood and yeah. A vegetarian over there and, you know, all, all different levels of, of great food here. And, uh, you know, it's great. I, there's my favorite is a Thai restaurant around the corner and they, they know me and they deliver, you know, so, I love and it. my other favorite is a, a Mexican restaurant that we use at the studio all the time when I'm over at Johnny's, um, which is, uh, he's over off of uh, cold water and, and more part. And we're in the studio over there and people come over to, 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 to work and they go, uh, I'm kind of getting kind of hungry and we all go, yeah, we'll go fish tacos. And we have this one place that we've been going to for 30 years. And, and I just call them up and I, the name, the place is ca called Tony's. And, and, and of course my name's Tony. I go, Hey, it's Tony. They go, Oh, hi, Tony. How you doing? They know me. They go, Are you, you guys in the studio today? Yeah. Yeah. Walk down the driveway and how many fish tacos you need? Oh, about eight, you know, and some walk, you know? And, uh, so we're always ordering in, but it's, uh, but it's really all good, healthy food back to where my location is excellent because I'm South of the Boulevard and, and it's, there's a quietness in my own neighborhood here for being right in the middle of, Ugh. you know, this, this populated area until certain times of the day. And you try to get out and the traffic's really bad on the Boulevard and getting on yeah. the freeway. And well, it's yeah. grown and grown. So. 
I, I just think you live. Yeah, you have, you live in the sexiest neighborhood in in Los it's Angeles. It's pretty sexy it and so sexy, yeah. so convenient. So I, another thing that I noticed in your story, and this is so similar. There's something about there's something in the water in Texas. You're originally from Houston, Texas. Is that right? Yes. Exactly. There's something yeah. about Texas and the multiculturalism. It's a little bit of like a southwestern melting pot. And there's mm-hmm. so much music and there's so much support for the arts. And I think that goes way back. So how did the bug start for you? I mean, there's so much. We could just talk about your relationship with uh, Taj Mahal and Bonnie Raitt and Robert Cray and, and have f- a five-hour master class. But how did it all start for you? I was, uh, <clears throat> my father was a guitar player, and so there was music around the house all the time. He never really played professionally. He was a weekend warrior. And when he got married, he stopped. When, no, when he got married, when he, when he had, had me, the first child, he stopped doing that because he didn't want to be out in honky tonks a weekend with a kid and now he had to make enough money to feed everybody and yeah. he was a he was a hard-working guy he was a carpenter and then he you know then later on he became an air conditioning engineer type guy so you know there was all it was working class came come up in the working class and i got that bug for music and really early i, I was the kind of kid that you'd see out on the dance floor at three years old dancing you know just moving around i couldn't yeah. stop myself <laughs> And um, I had that rhythm thing and, and I was always, you know, I would react to it very easily if I heard something I liked. <clears throat> and then um, my cousin, so funny, this is a funny story. My cousin would babysit me sometimes and she was about six, seven years older. And she was, um, she was listening to the African-American stations in my town and the two of the KCOH and KYLK. And my father only listened to country music. That was it. Mm. And uh, I was of the age by then that I wanted to drive, but obviously I was way too young. But I would, I would beg my dad, if you let me back the car up 30 feet around to the, where the hose is, every Saturday I'll wash the car for you and I'll wipe it down and I'll do that. Just let me drive the car that far and then drive it back that far. It was 30 feet, you know. And he would let me put it in gear and drive. And he first time, a couple times he sat with me, made sure I could do it. And then, so every Saturday I get to do that. But in doing that, I'd open up the doors when I'm drying it all off and I would turn up the radio like you do when you're washing your car back in the day. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Turn the radio up and get some music going. So oh, there was nothing but country music on the radio. And um, so I went over to the old, this is old, this is quite a while ago when he had push buttons on the dash and I pushed in the buttons and pulled them out. I dialed to the station. Then you pull the button out and push it in. So the last two buttons out of the six were on African-American stations, on the black stations in my town. The next day, Sunday, we're driving out to Grandma's for brunch in the afternoon, you know, a Sunday afternoon dinner, and uh, the windows are down, and my dad's a button pusher on the radio, and the radio's blaring. I'm in a back seat, and my dad, and it, my dad punches the last two buttons, and I never thought about this when I did ah. that. And he goes, what the hell is, you know, he's like, what is that? Where did that music come from? You know, he's like, somebody messed with his radio. And I went, well, it was me, dad. And, you know, he goes, what are you doing? Listen to that kind of music, you know, and growing up down there, you know what it's like in the South. You spent plenty of time in Tennessee. Oh, yeah. So, uh, it, and uh, so he said, well, where did you hear that music? I said, cousin Betty, you know, I was trying to like. I wasn't Pass in trouble. He was just, yeah, he was, I wasn't really in trouble. He was just really concerned about why I'm listening to that kind of music. And that was it. And I was hooked and I couldn't help myself. And then uh, I, my cousin had a drum kit. He was, uh, he got a, a kit. He was two years older than I. And so he got a kit probably about the age of 12. And I would go sit down in his drum kit till he would run me off. And I, I always wanted to hit things and play. And few years later, I started playing on the boxes and stuff like that in the backyard. And then I went to my best friend, Willie Arnellis, had started playing. And, uh, and he lived down the street from me. And um, Funk attack. Uh, Willie was, yeah, we're, Willie's an amazing, very, very accomplished drummer from Al Jarreau and, and White Trash, you know, yeah. uh, Funk Attack. Uh, did uh, Mike Post TV shows for years. Some oh, of yeah. Iconic didn't, did he play on uh, Law and Order or, or no? Or is that so, yeah, Lawn R. Yeah, played on several of those uh, programs that 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 Mike Post uh, did the music for. Anyhow, he was my 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 big brother, my neighbor, and still is still is my big brother. And uh, he had a drum kit, and I'm like, I'm hearing the drums, and I'm walking by. I cannot not knock on the door. Hey Willie, can I see your drums? You know, 
and we started hanging out together. And then um, I, we started listening to that kind of music, heavily listening to rhythm and blues together. We buy records and stuff and jazz crept in a little bit later, but basically mainly, you know, Bobby Bland, Ray Charles, Jimmy Reed, you know, yeah. all the blues stuff and then all the R&B stuff. And then the stacks thing came out and all of that, you know, Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and all that stuff came out of the woodworks. And we were listening to all of that. And, and um, sorry, let me turn this off. By got a gig, man. Like, Somebody wants yeah, Tony scam, to play. Scam likely. Uh, um, and so I one day I was there and uh, he he said, I, I'm selling that other drum kit in there. I'm selling that drum kit in there. And he goes. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm buying the other one that my friend lent me. I'm trying it out. It was a Rogers kit. And I said, really? He goes, you want to buy that kit? And I said, <laughs> uh, well, I don't really have any money, but um, yeah, how much you want? He goes, 150 bucks between now and next Saturday. That's a week. After that, um, price goes up to 200. I went, okay. So without even really asking my parents, i I drove my motor scooter over to a, a lawnmower shop and sold it for $45. There's 45. Okay. 45. And like walk back like two miles, you know, and walk back to this place. And went, Here's a down payment. I want the drums. <clears throat> sit down at the back and the table in the kitchen in the back there of his house. And we always sat in the kitchen because we were always waiting for somebody to drop some food off. We were, you know, we were that age where we could eat anything. All, any food. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And his mom and his dad were both great cooks, you know, you know, Hispanic, you know, Mexican food was like oh all, my God. Over, all over the place, and, you know? So we're sitting there and he gets a phone call and he picks up the phone. He goes, hi. Uh, yeah. Hey man, how you doing? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm working tonight. Uh, do I know any other drummers? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. And he looks across the table at me. He goes, you want a gig? And I went, how cool and supportive was he like just a little yeah. older than you or same age or yeah yeah like two or three years older than me yeah nice he goes i said well i gotta go ask my mom and dad if i can go play in a nightclub awesome. you know what i mean because i was only 15 and so uh he said well you better get down there and ask him so i went down and, and uh asked my mom and dad and they said no about a million times and finally i got caught my dad weak and he said yeah all right well here's the deal uh I don't think you want to make a habit of this, you know, even though he was a musician, he wasn't supportive of me being ah. a musician, but eh, cause he was afraid. He was afraid, you know, of the part of town we lived in and the things that went on in nightclubs. And so, and he goes, well, here's the deal, but you can't, don't take any funny cigarettes off anybody and don't talk to any of the women. I said, dad, I'm 15. Okay. I don't do those kind of things. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. You know, yeah. I'm going to go play drums. Sorry. And I go down to Willie's and I said, I, I got it. I got the gig and everything. So he calls the guy back. He says, yeah, Tony can do the gig. Come pick him up in my house. I didn't have a car. So the guy picks me up in front of Willie's house. And I'm like, you know, I'm five, eight. Now I might've been five, two or five, three back then. You know? Amazing. I was a short little guy. Yeah. We're both five. And eight. they picked yeah. me up. Yeah, exactly. And they were, they were so scared when they picked me up and they realized it was my first gig. They were like, they freaked out. They're they like, like, oh, oh no. What oh, do you know any songs? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's exactly what I said. Well, what do you know? I said, well, I know blah, blah, blah. And I know this, that, that, that. I started reeling out the song book that I figured they want to know. Well, okay. Well, I didn't play all of that, you know? And it was very funny. It was a very funny yeah. scene. And I did the gig. They loved me. And they asked me back the next weekend. And I, you know, Despite going and finishing high school and spending a couple years in college, I just couldn't couldn't do anything else. I love it. So the bug was there. The seed had been planted. And I think it's just so cool of your of your friend, Willie, to be like, he was like a yeah. big brother and he was like grooming you. That's I yeah. love those kind of stories. Now, he was so successful in Los Angeles. Does he still have a residence there or did I did I hear? Was he like a really smart guy and moved to another country where his money goes farther? <laughs> He has an incredible place right on the on the ocean in, near La Paz. Look at uh, this. Uh, awesome. Yeah, he's, uh, I was just down there about four weeks ago and I'm going back again in July. That's and, so smart. You know, it's like it's like it's like I go there and hang out with family. It's like it's like family. I go there and hang out. And I'm on the beach <sighs> and um, I'm going to probably I'm going to invest in a little bit of my uh, little piece of land down there. You know, why That's not? That's awesome. And uh, yeah. And so, I mean, if, if someday I get half and half where I don't want to be in the middle of the hustle all the time. I, I can go roll down there and it's, we found a, 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 an easier, cheaper way than flying from LAX to Cabo San Lucas and then driving back up the peninsula. We, we drive down to Tijuana. We go, we park the car there at the border. 
we go across this border, CBX, it's called, you cross border express to the Tijuana airport. You get on a plane there, you go to La Paz. Um, then I'm only 45 minutes from Willie's house. Amazing. And he comes and picks me up. That's what yeah, California, cool. that's their, uh, their weekend getaway is, is uh, another country. That's awesome. It's 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 wonderful. It's badass. And yeah. it's once you get there, you just don't care. You know what I mean? Because I, I always think I always think to myself, you know, like I I mean, I don't think any of us are ever going to retire as creatives because we just love it so much. Just what's to retire from? We're not Walmart readers. We love what we right. do, right? But the right. but I'm thinking like, you know, do I want to die in that, in Tennessee or do I want to be in you know around palm trees or you know I like desert environments too. You know, yeah. you think about these things because. 22 becomes 52 very quickly. I mean, in a blink of an eye, you know, it it, it goes faster and faster and faster. Yeah, it really does. I've, I turned 72 and last September and it just goes fast. And I am already, where is it? September. It's what we're, I'm not that far away from the next one. And I'm just going, what am I going to do? I mean, you know, like I said earlier, to me at this point in life is I've got to just be doing meaningful things. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm hustling. I'm yeah. working. I'm a businessman. I'm a producer. I've got, sure. I got a, you know, a long list of things and record yeah. labels and managers and all, you know, and stuff like that. But, but I, I keep a very creative mind flowing all of the time. Absolutely. Time. So Tony, what is, what is um, the record that you produced? You produced so many records, multi genres that won the Grammy. Tell us about that one. The one that won the Grammy was a live record on Taj Mahal. Uh, all right. It, 2000 and we had we'd been on the road in europe and taj had been off for this other tour and uh the terms weren't quite right and he and he, and he was trying to milling over it and everything and uh, i remember we got off of a at, a at a german truck stop you know we get off the bus and he goes we're gonna do a live record we're not gonna do that tour i think it'd be more important to do the live record i went okay so i went to work booking the club, which I knew really well, the mint in Hollywood. Oh, yes. And, uh, and your name is on the wall the and it's misspelled. Yeah. I, when I saw that, I was I was mad. I wanted I said, I want to talk to the manager. <laughs> That's funny. I signed this drum there on, on a, that, uh, that the club bought at a, at a raffle for a uh, benefit for uh, our engineer. In fact, the lady who engineered that live record and we, we cut the record over three days and uh, I was never dubbed to be the producer. I. I'm the guy who organized everything while there was supposed to be a producer show up. And he, for some reason or another, had a clash in concept and schedule. And I said, okay, don't worry. I got it. So I hired the engineer. I got all the tape together. I did it. I got everybody on the schedule. We played three nights. Uh, I took the guys in one afternoon. I said, we have two new original songs that have been written. I co-wrote one with Taj and Taj wrote another one. And I said, we're going to record these and make them bonus tracks on the live record, but we'll do it on the live stage in the yeah. daytime without a crowd. And I'll just add the crowd later. You oh, know add the mean? crowd noise. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and, and so I did that and I got it down to about 22, then down to 18 and then down to 15. And then I sat down with Ta- 13. Yeah. And then I sat down with Taj and we picked the show and the songs he wanted. And uh, he trusted me the whole time. He just yeah. totally trusted me. I put it together and he loved it. And yeah. Being being the style of recording it was, it was like ADATs back in the day because oh, yeah. the, the management wouldn't give me enough money to get reel to reel tape. And, you know, I had several reels, quite a few reels because we did three nights, two shows a night. I walked away from there with ADATs and a, 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 an ADAT a stereo and, and then all of the, uh, the, the individual tracks. Uh, and I listened to 103 takes over three nights over the next 10 days. Wow. And I made copious notes. And I still have those notes. And I got to the point where it's down to the number of songs. Ch- uh, Taj chose them. I finished mixing it. I had it mastered, put it out on a label on Hannibal Records. Um, it was selling good for a while. And I don't, you know, maybe he was out on the road and something else got in the way. But it's, it, I, it, I know it sold 40, 50, 60,000 copies, something like that. Yeah. And, um, and it got nominated for a Grammy. And I'm, I love that. I'm going, wow. Wow. Uh, okay, long shot, right? You know, especially a live record. No, man. And we're sitting there in, in the afternoon and they, they, they yelled it out. And I went, I, I couldn't, my feet wouldn't touch the ground. I was going to the stage like this, you know? <laughs> like, now, is this where they, know? they, 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 like, cause I feel like a lot of like the artistic music, like jazz, blues, classical, fusion, all that, like, thir- you know, uh, like ethno, 
ethnic music. It's never on the show. It's like a separate ceremony. Nah, nah. I mean, if you're not twerking with a bunch of dancers on stage, you're not being televised. Yeah, no. it's, you have to be mainstream pop to be able to be on that screen. And even if you're a country, you're going to be pretty, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate to use the word sold out, but you know, you and I both know how we feel about real music and real players. And, sure. You know, yeah. you do that all the time. Your boss yeah. and the band you're in is a fantastic band of great oh, musicians. Thank you. I know you hang around with nothing but the cream of the crop and you work with them all the time. You told me the stuff that you do in the studio. You, you, we, I don't want to do anything else. You know, no. I got my studio here. I could do some programming, but I tend to try to talk the artist out of if they bring something in this program. I go, why don't we see if we could take this programming thing that you're doing? And make sounds like that, but make it for real. Organically. Yeah. And when I, whenever I convince them and when we do the right job, they absolutely love it. Go, oh, my God, it's so much better than a machine. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you and, 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 and Tom Hambridge are kind of in a similar space where he's very involved with production in the blues category, a lot with Buddy Guy and stuff. I, I'm assuming you guys are pals. We are pals. Tom is tearing it up, man. I, congratulations, Tom Hambridge. Grammy's with Buddy Guy and Al Grammy with Kingfish. And I saw he was doing something two days ago with uh, uh, what's the guy uh, uh, from the Almond Brothers son. Oh, uh, yeah. Is it was it? Uh, yeah. yeah. And he had Adam Deach playing drums and all that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Ivan, Ivan Neville and George Porter and uh, um, Devin Allman. Yes. And so um, and Devin and I, here's how it works. Devin and I sp spoke many years ago about making a record together. We talked about it for, for a while. And there's people that Tom's produced that I've spoken to. And then, I, and I have, you know, we kind of, I wouldn't say we share or feed each other, but Tom and Eric Korn, another uh, producer out here. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's a handful of guys that I know that we're kind of in a circle where, you know, it's like that guy where there's a producer, that guy's a producer, you know, yeah. he's done so-and-so and he's done so-and-so. And I've kind of become one of those in the blues community. Mostly I do a little, you know, I can do some, Americana and some full on sure. R and B and, and rock and roll. And yeah. uh, I've done, I haven't done much country, but I've done some folky kind of singer songwriter stuff, you know, really soft and easy and, uh, you know, but uh, I've developed a, a relationship uh, and an uh, uh, um, um, reputation as a producer, Absolutely. as well as being the drummer that I've been with all these people for so many years. Now, as a producer, so, uh, do you, do you, um, I'm sure that you've played on, many or most of the things that you've produced, but um, do you like to be in a situation where uh, you're more just in the control room with the big picture and then there's a session drummer or a band drummer, or do you like to get down and dirty and produce from the floor? I, I always say I learned to produce from sitting in the drum chair yeah. and, you know, from listening to the way things form and come together as a drummer over all of these years that I've done this, I always say I produce from the drum chair. Now I do sit there behind a the control and direct and, and coach. And, you know, I've did, uh, I did one in Kansas city. I, she used her own drummer and uh, I'm about, I've got one. I'm starting week after next. And, and the, the road drummer is going to get a chance to play on this, you nice. know, and, and, and it's good for him, you know, it's good for all those guys, you know, and but in most cases I, 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 I say that conditionally to the artist. I'll use your cats up to a certain point. And if I'm not getting what I want, then I'm going to go to plan B, which is, yes. you know, and they understand and, and, that. And, yeah. and they do, they yeah. totally understand because they want the best record. So, but, um, but I do like to be behind the drum kit, but it, I have thought about maybe it's time for me to start using some of my friends because I have some of the most amazing drummers around me right now that I know I could just say, Count it off. It would be fine. Right. Yeah, you know I'm going to refill I mean? my coffee and I'm going to check out the big I'm, picture here. And I'm getting coffee. I got a couple of calls. I'll be back with you in a minute. I'll cut a track. You know? Oh, yeah. Like a 1990s Nashville producer. There you, you go. You call the band say, and you go play golf. I, I didn't want to say any names, but I know no, guys no. like that. And it's well, it's but changed, I, but there, when, you know, when, uh, there was a period where it was just so methodical and the, there was just the, the, how it, it was all done. It was like, yeah. call the band. Um, well, that's exciting. And then just your work as a drummer, maintaining these relationships over the years, how did, was it more like chunks? Like you're working with Taj, you're working with Robert Cray, you're working with Bonnie Raitt, or is it a thing where you're on a call constantly with these people and it's like first come first serve or like, how does it, how do you, how did you do it all? 
I mean, when I moved here in 79, I, it was cold. I had lived in England for five years previous to that. And I oh, was okay. working, uh, I started the first year I was there and in London, I, I worked for Island Records and I was just a staff guy and I just played on whatever they wanted me to play on that didn't have a drummer or needed a drummer. That's cool. And then I joined a rock band uh, with Paul Kossoff called Backstreet Crawler and we signed to Atlantic and did two records and then Paul passed away, uh, drugs and everything and we uh, kept going and kept the rock band thing going. And uh, It became Crawler, uh, right? Crawler, that? yeah. Like, crawler. Yeah, Crawler. <laughs> and... Um, then I moved back in 79 and I decided I, that was my third attempt at moving to Los Angeles. But, and I don't know, I twice before I'd been interrupted and I was really packed bags packed moving to LA to st- because Willie was living here. So yeah. my, my support system was here. Sure. <clears throat> so I finally did move here in 79 mm-hmm. and I stayed at his place and slept on his couch for was several months. And then uh, I was able to like squeeze enough work together at, Fifty dollars, fifty or hundred dollars at a time to be able to pay rent, and so I yeah. got a place to live with. And um, I, my first touring was uh, was with Eric Burden because when I got here, I had asked, been asked to go in the studio and cut some demos that ended up being used on a record later on. And I did, so I ended up doing some live work with him, and uh, that's how we first met. And then I kind of did that and got the Ricky Lee Jones road gig by someone that worked at Warner Brothers. They knew that uh, <clears throat> this guy had been doing showcases with, was working at Warner Brothers and said, Ricky Jones, Ricky Lee Jones is looking for drummers. And, um, oh, okay, well, I didn't think it was my thing. And although there's nothing in that music I can't play. Was that pre Chucky's uh, in Love? It was right after Chucky's in Love. It was gotcha. Pirates. So you got to and, play boom, the little gad thing. Oh, I, I went to the Steve Gadd school because I last time I saw Gadd a couple months ago, you know, we're not really close friends, but we've met before. And he goes, hey, Tony, good to see you. Da, da, da. And I went to see him again. And I said, I just got to tell you, man, I went I went to school on you when I when I took Ricky's gig. And he goes, oh, wow, that's an interesting gig I had. You know, he recorded all of those records. I said, I just went to school on you, man. And I, I'm still using all some of that today. Oh, so yeah, steal I've been it. stealing from you, Steve, like everybody else has, you know. Yeah. But I, I got the Ricky gig and I kind of back and forth between Ricky and Eric. And then I, um, uh, it, it, it went good. And then right after uh, that next summer, I, I am now on the call list for one of the, for a young, capable drummer that could play many different styles to go on the road with people. So my next call was the next year was uh, after a couple of years later was um, – Bette Midler. So I went on the road wow. with Bette Midler. It was a fabulous gig, man. Wow. Uh, the music was good, and she treated the band like wonderful. She was just such a sweetheart. I love to hear she that. Ex- yeah, she took excellent care of the musicians and really cared because she knows keep the level of music up, and you're going to sound great. Yeah. And I did that, and right around, and I'd been eyeballed already by Bonnie Raitt when that happened, apparently, someone told me. And uh, then that that I was around town working with Etta James and different artists around town and Katie Seagal before she became a big actress and, and doing sessions. And uh, there was a few ca- accounts that I had calls for regularly to, you know, to go and play on sessions and I would do jingles and whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and then I, um, Bonnie was looking for a drummer and she showed up at uh, the, the jazz club. I was playing out with Etta James and, uh, Pretty much hired me on the spot just by watching me play. There you go. And and, uh, and I went out on the road with her for seven years, I think. Yeah. Seven awesome. or eight. Seven, something like that. And was there when she won all the Grammys for a nick of time, you yeah. know? Um, I didn't, I played on, I didn't play on all of that. I, uh, Ricky Fatar was her drummer, preferred drummer in the studio at the time. Cause Is he so still her go. live drummer? Is he still her live drummer? Yeah. Yeah. Rick. Ricky's still playing with her. Yeah. Yeah. And I played on some tracks in the nick of time and, and a couple of tracks in the next record. And, and then I played on, I can't make you love me. Well, there's a, there's, there's a massive urban legend in the drumming world surrounding. I can't make you love me. Right. Weren't you the last piece of the pie to Perfectly get it across put. home plate? Perfectly put. I was on my way up to, uh, uh, United studios and, um, <clears throat> uh, my drums had been carted over and set up and tuned back in the days when we had all that, you know, that oh, was, yeah. I had a guy who knew my drum kit and made them sound perfect. And 
and you just walk in and play. And, oh, I um, love it. Yeah. We still I, do I it in Nashville. About, you guys still do it in LA, but it's just the budgets yeah, aren't there. Somewhat, all the time. Yeah. somewhat the budgets aren't always there to have some. I, I'm over at place. Angel City. I got some stuff over there in Burbank. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They got, yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to go over there today and get something fixed. I'll probably take it over there tomorrow. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, we were in a, uh, I'm driving up and, uh, and, and Don was a producer is outside and he goes, um, Hey man, hurry up, hurry up. He sees me parking my car. I said, what, 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 I'm not late. He goes, no, no, I need you now. So we go inside and they'd been, they'd been trying to get this song together for a few hours and it wasn't coming together. And so Don says, just go sit and play, just go play. You have brushes. And I go, yeah, yeah. I pull the brushes out. And I, I didn't even listen to the song, just counted it off and started playing. So you and, never uh, created a chart to learn the structure. No. You were learning the structure. As we recorded. Oh, my God. There's something like walking a tightrope like that. But there's like little two, four <laughs> bars and stuff in there, which are, there could, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the other thing that I noticed, because yeah. I just listened to it before we did this interview. It's on the treadmill. I'm listening to it. And the bass player is pushing on the end of two sometimes. And but then you're grounding it. You're playing boom, grounding it, yeah, boom, boom, and then sometimes you go boom, boom, boom. But then you have the brushes, and the the challenging thing with the brushes is getting the. You can always hear the thup, the backbeat of the left hand, but sometimes depending on how the snare is mic'd or your the snare head, or you can't hear the yeah. right hand subdivisions. Which is right, not what were the much. brushes? Were they wire? Were they plastic? They, no, they were they were wire. I, I just didn't play it hard. I, just, I actually played it almost cocktail style but oh, with yeah. the backbeat. So I, I actually went. Ch, 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 oh my god! Ch. I played. I played just. I just, I just shushed them the whole time. Yeah. I never played that. 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 No. Now, was there a light? Was there a light click percolating or no? No. Oh my god. <laughs> We just played. It was like, yeah, but I mean, like that everybody else was recorded except for you. So you had to fall into the, the feel of yeah, a previous basically. situation. Yeah. They, they were all, they had already imprinted what they were going to do pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just sat down and kept time. And Don always says, you just tied it all together. Even though I didn't, <clears throat> you know, you and I would work out certain patterns that we do in s s different parts of it. Boom, tap, boom, boom, or you know, or the anticipation or whatever that you had mentioned, yeah. you'd probably work those things out with the bass player and or whatever on the next take and then the next take and then the next yes. take. <clears throat> so we did that take and then we did the next take and then the next take and then the next take. Probably, I don't remember where we stopped. It was around four or five. And, you know, Bonnie said, can we try it again? And you can't blame her, you know? And we kept trying the song over and over and over and we went in to listen and finally... The producer Don Waz goes, "Hey, uh, Ed, put that first tape back on," and it was it was the analog to it, and we put it on. It's like smoke came out of the speakers. It was so magic, you know. What I mean, it's just one of these moments. We're all going, "Uh oh, goosebumps," and um, and that was it. And Don goes, "I don't know about anybody else, but that's the take. I'm sorry." And with imperfections and whatever, and there wasn't anything that was wrong about what I added to it. Technically, other than like you said, if compositionally as a drummer, you wanted to write parts out, you might have done something differently. Did you say to yourself, OK, this is I know I could be more articulate or, or maybe telegraph sections more. God, I wish we could go and want a later take. But all right, Don likes it. Like, Were you fine to resign yourself like, hey, everyone's happy? I thought I thought I was rehearsing when I played it. <sighs> yeah. You know, I really thought I was rehearsing. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they chose it, I, I, you couldn't say no when you listen back to it when compared to the other takes. The other takes yeah. didn't suck, but yeah, there was something that was lacking in, in the fact that no, you know. Everyone knew I where they were going. The song and what, yeah. yeah, yeah. They knew. Uh, sorry. No, it's right. It's oh, boy, a I should turn this up. Production. Business. Hello. Thank you. That's video right there. I have to put together some. I videos, love it. So. Bluesproducer.com. Hey, um, so and so, uh, you know, you were saying you split credits with Ricky on some of the stuff. And if I had album notes, which don't exist anymore, I could probably find out. But did, was that you or Ricky on? That's him playing drums. 
Okay. That's him playing drums and I play percussion. Did yeah. you play timbales or was that part of his drums? <laughs> yeah, I play the timbales. And, <laughs> no, I play timbales awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. All those yeah. things are me. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how drummers are like, no, I don't play percussion. It's like, dude, buy some shakers and maracas and tambourines and learn how to do this stuff. You get paid twice. What the hell is wrong with I, you? I, I do it all the time. I mean, you know, when we finished our Phantom Blues Band record in January, I just took the tracks over here and I sat down with my engineer at the time. And I've got my congas out and my bongos out and my, my timbales out and my cajon out and every shaker and cowbell and tambourine that I had in the garage. And I've got bags and bags of this sure. stuff. And I brought it all out and I found the right ones that worked. And then I, you know, the little blocks that you put in the middle of the reggae song and the, this on the funk song. And I just played whatever I wanted. And, and I sent the, tra- the, the, the files back to our, you know, to Johnny who was engineering it and he mixed it all in. And I, I kind of edited it as I went, but I mean, for the most part, I just kind of wanted it to be raw and everything and fun. Yeah. But I do that. I mean, <clears throat> my favorite percussionist on records that I produce in this town is Lenny Castro. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, hands down, his feel is incredible. I love Luis Conte. Luis Conte is wonderful. Uh, there's so uh, uh, Kevin, Kevin, uh, uh, Picard, uh, Kevin Picard, Kevin, yeah, Kevin Ricard. Ricardo, Kevin yeah, Kevin Ricard, yeah. yeah, Kevin Ricard. Yeah, Kevin Ricard. Picard. Really He's like love. on Star Trek. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so there's so many great guys here, you know. But uh, so I started doing it myself as well, and it just depends on the budget and the project. But whenever I can, I I send it to Lenny. He's got a studio in his house. Now. Hey, Lenny, and Lenny can play tambourine on something, and the track's already better. Just tambourine. Yeah, it's, it's so the glue. Good. It is so the yeah, glue. He glues it so wonderfully. So. I love it. I met him one time on the. Um, why can I not think of this? He's a he's a Mexican American actor, comedian, had his own television show, Low Rider. He had he had like a sitcom, oh, George Lopez. Oh, so he had a short lived talk yeah. show. Yeah. And so I met him because he was in the house band, and uh, he was yeah, very nice guy, very complimentary, cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. oh yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's cool. Yeah. Very positive. Good to be around. Yeah. Now, what are what yeah, are the tried- tracks of note with Robert Cray? What were the tracks of note with him? Oh, you know, I did two records with him while I was with him. And, uh, oh, I mean, is that you on like strong persuader or that's any of that? No, no. Later, later on, later on, uh, I, there's a song I wrote. It's a shuffle. It's a double shuffle called, uh, 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 love and you baby. I can't remember any of my own song. Uh, uh, it, it, anyhow, it's, it's on the second record that I did with him. That strong, and not because it's my song. Uh, oh God, my brain's gone right now. Yeah, look up on your own Spotify here. Let me. I'll look up Robert Cray. Yeah, Let me see here. What's the name of the record? Uh, I got to get all that down right here. Hold on, one second. Whoa. Okay, if you guys are just listening, Tony's in his home studio and he is looking through his discography. We got Robert Cray. I'm on the. Uh, I'm on the Spotify here on my phone. It's kind of like I always like to listen to everybody's body of work as much as I can. Well, before we do these things, this um, is called, that's what keeps me rocking. That's what keeps that's me what rocking. Keeps me, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. And and um, all those things are, are so funky on that uh, chicken in the kitchen. Um, uh, Trouble and pain, truce. And then the next record we did, there's a song called Love 2009. And I and I, even though it was a blues record, I kind of put my hip hop feel to the funk of it, you know, yeah. to the R and B of it, you know. And I kind of moved the hi hat around a little bit and put the bass drum and the and the kick drum in a certain place, and you know. So I I I, I loved playing with Robert. He was very very musical. And yeah. It was very simple and straightforward. There wasn't a lot of crap. There wasn't a lot of production on top. It was like. You know, great track, great guitar player, great rhythm guitar player, great singer, you know, and uh, yeah. my friend Richard Cousins on bass. And and then my really good friend that I'm still working with a lot, um, uh, Jim Pugh, and uh, he played keyboards on it. And I'm looking at the live thing we did as well, uh, live in Mobile. That that That's a very good 12, 15 song, whatever, live concert right there yeah. of, of us playing it's it's really good. It's Robert it's Cray live in because, Mobile. Very very yeah, nice. Yeah. And yeah, I got to tell yeah. you, I was I also saw that you know that you did probably forty episodes of According to Jim, the sitcom with Jim Belushi, and you were in his band 
Um, and some of the footage I saw, it just sounds like you guys weren't miming to a pre-existing recording. It looks like you were playing live on the set. On, on the set, we were goofing. We were goofing. And oh, playing. you were miming? Sometimes, no, sometimes we were playing real. And, so, and, and uh, several of the most, all the, uh, the, all the other guys in the garage band were actors. They couldn't actually play their instrument. So they were, but we they would were, have people, we would have people off stage often playing some other instruments while I'm playing drums on stage. And we would, you know, if we wanted that kind of a live thing. And a lot of the stuff was pre recorded, and, and all of which I played on because the keyboard player in the band was uh, doing the, um, the programming and everything. And, and the, he was the, the composer for the TV show. So you're playing so, the music for the television show. Then you're the on-camera well. drummer, which means you're SAG card act. You're a SAG actor. Unbelievable. And then I got to yeah. just say, I know what those checks look like when you're yeah. an on-camera actor on a primetime sitcom. Then it goes yeah. into syndication. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Tony. That's awesome. I'm still getting paid. Yeah. I'm still getting checked. They've, they've gone way down because it's, it's in syndication, but it's not in any... Uh, well, it's... It's still out there. Quite it's still a bit. out there, but it's not like Big Bang Theory or like or like uh, Friends. But still, right. So I, I still get some checks from it, absolutely, and and I got a, a I got a, a SAG pension from it. So I mean, I'm drawing a monthly pension from what? My, That's incredible. From, uh, now, th yeah. was there ever a time where you had where you were away from the drums or you were behind the drums, but you had lines? Oh, I had lines on almost every show. There you I, go. I had lines. Yeah, it's awesome. I had lines. And they, you had, they, they wrote they wrote my character in because they went they not being the uh, the consummate actor that they really probably wanted consummate comic actor. I'm still a goofball. OK. Right. And uh, basically, I, I was taught very soon that it, it, to not try to be funny because the writers were going to write me extremely funny lines that they, they told me, read it like the phone book because it's a funny line. All you have to do is say that line. And you're going to get last because it was perfectly written. Out, yeah. By a comedy writer. Yeah. I was I found out that the, just the deadpan de delivery was all I needed. I didn't have to act stupid or goofy or anything. You no. know? I went, you know, I was going to go into my audition with trying to act. And, and Jim wanted me to have the part really, really bad because he wanted a musician in the band, in the garage, someone who knew music and being a drummer that kind of knows his way around a few different instruments and as a producer as well. I got ears and concept. <clears throat> so Jim kind of wanted Jim wanted someone that was in his band in the garage band and the, the, the de developers of the show went, well, when they saw me in the pilot, they went, well, I think that guy there behind the drums, you know, uh, we think if we're going to try to pick anybody. So Jim That's says awesome. you're going for an audition next week. And Jim was on vacation and I'm here learning the lines and everything. And it's like 30 minutes before I'm going over to the studio to audition. And he says, hey, man. Uh, he's calling me nervous. He says, How you doing? You got the lines? I said, yeah, I got it. He goes, read them out to me. Read them out to me. <laughs> so I read them out to him and I was trying to be funny. And he goes, no, 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 no. Stop. Tony, Tony, look, man, don't put anything into it. Now read this again, but read it like the phone book. Okay. I read it back. He goes, that's how I want you to deliver it. Went, really? Okay. Unbelievable. So I get over to the, to the, to the room of 30 or 40 actors Half of my recognized from TV commercials or other TV shows that everybody wants to get a series in this town. If you're oh, an actor. Yeah. Yeah. I walk in, they don't recognize me because I'm not in their circle and they're looking around and like, who's that guy? You know, I got a couple of sideways looks like, who's that guy? And I'm with my actor buddy who was, was on the show as well and, and is in his band, but he is good and he's a great actor and he's a comedic actor. So we're in this room of all these uh, actors and, and, they're looking around and they're all bumping each other's elbows. Like, who's that guy over there? Like, who's a stranger? Somebody lakes it out that I'm the drummer in Jim's band, his real band. Oh, man, you talk about sucking up. There's five, three or four guys who come, hey, man, what's your name? Tony, I'm Bob here. I'm Lasagna. Good to see you, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. they figured I'm going to get the, I'm going to be the shoe in if I'm J in Jim's band. You know, it's such so a brutal, I go in and I, brutal industry. I go, well, you know it. You've done it yourself. Oh, so, my God. Uh, you walk into these situations and you just have to turn your give a shitter off when you go to do this and go oh, be yourself and, and don't think about it and walk out the door and go home. And that's it. You know, you can't take any rejection with you from that room. 
No. And um, I walked into the room to read it. And the guy was a guy that had been doing commercials on TV. And he was so friggin' funny. I laughed at him all the time on TV. And he's reading with me. And he read the part, he said, his side, really big and funny. Because he could. I, not me. And I read mine flat. And they like straight guy. You're the straight guy. Yeah. Yeah. And so they go switch parts. I said, well, I didn't learn the other part. He goes, well, just read it. So we switched and everything. And I go, ah, thank you very much. Great. Good. I go outside out in the, in the waiting room again. And, uh, they came out and they, they, they called back about five, six, seven guys. And my name wasn't on the list. And, and I looked at my friend, John, I said, what does that mean? And I said, does that mean we're, you know, he goes, yeah, probably let's go. So we split, I get home. Jim calls me again. Hey man. Hey, Hey, how to go, how to go. But well, it went fine. I did what you told me to do. And, you know, so I said, but you know, uh, you, you didn't get called back. I said, no, he goes, how many people got called back? I said, Oh, five, six, seven, something like that. He goes, Oh, oh I'm sorry, man. Oh, well, look, man, thanks for going through all this with me. And I appreciate it. Cause he really wanted me in there Damn. to help him handle the show. So, 30 minutes later, I'm sitting here going, I'm okay. I got gigs. I got, you know, I'm making a living and I'm playing drums. I have a career already. I'm not worried about being an actor. And about 30 minutes later, he calls back and he says, callbacks don't mean shit, man. You're going to SAG on Monday and signing up. And I went, okay. That means you got the job. I got the job, you know? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, the only uh, reason I got my SAG card is because there's so many rules. It's like you, it's the chicken and the egg thing. It's like, well, you need so many jobs yeah. to get the SAG card, but you need the SAG card to get so many jobs. And someone just, I did a show. I played a cop like we do as drummers and they championed me and, and Taft Hart believed me and I got the card, oh, you know? Wow. Yeah. Cool, man. You know, I haven't worked since, going? but uh, oh, I was going to say, are you doing any other audition? I mean, it, I it was like pre COVID, but during COVID, you know, I have like, I have agents, I have hosting agents, I have voiceover agents and I'm in the game. And, and I saw it like for seven years, I got to experience that other side of, um, of creativity and the theatrical arts and like what these yeah. people go through and why they're waiters. And then the hustle and the 80 auditions, they go through a year to get one job. And it's like, Wow incredible I know. you know it is it is incredible it uh it, it takes a lot of dedication to want to do that you know yeah it's, you know it's like uh i i just could i i i took uh i took improv lessons during that this time i i was already wanting to take improv lessons so what'd you do like I'd, um uh, improv comedy you know just stand up oh you look, did it look, during look. when you were filming according to jim yeah. And then once I got the job there, I went, I'm going to go tighten myself up again. And it gave me so much confidence to go up on a stage with nothing to talk about and find something to talk about. Did you, I, I, was, you did I know it, I was going to ask you UCB. I did UCB level one and two. Yeah. Did, okay. Did you do what else was there in LA for the improv uh, classes? Oh, um, groundlings. I thought about going and starting over the groundlings, but it's very uh, involved. You know what I mean? And I yeah. was doing something that was a little bit more casual with some guys that were really, really good uh, in, uh, improv teachers. Yeah. Uh, some people from Second City. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, so I, I, I'd, I'd learned already a lot from those guys. And, um, and then I would go and watch improv a lot. And I yeah. still do. I really, really, really enjoy going and watching improv when it's, it's out. And, um, uh, and, and uh, that's kind of, that helped me hone the acting thing a little bit more where I just had much more confidence in myself. And I realized I could sigh and drop my shoulders and learn the line and say it and really not worry about whether I was being, you know, Marlon Brando or not, you know what yeah. I mean? Or whether I was being, you know, some extremely funny guy or whatever. So just exist, okay, you know? just, just exist. Just be, it really, it, it catches you by surprise when you try too hard. And, you know, I remember. I mean, they, 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 uh, they, what's, what's the word when you uh, go into a fraternity and you get kind of nailed at first? Oh, uh, um, hazed. They, they hazed me on the first show <laughs> and, and uh, they had the script lady bring, you know, I had, I had two lines, I think, you know, and uh, uh, on that show uh, in one scene. And, uh, oh no, I had one line in one, in that first show in one scene. Uh, there are no cats in the Bible. That was the line. <clears throat> and um, but before the show, they said they've changed your part. And the script lady comes over and hands me this big, long speech. And I'm supposed like to a hear. giant monologue, a full page. Oh, exactly. And I went, 
what's what's this? She goes, well, they've changed your part. They wrote some more lines for you. And she was deadpan. <laughs> and I went over to Jim's assistant and I went, Jesse, I said, um, he goes, uh, what, Tony? What? Oh, 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 you got some new lines. Wow. Great. They're giving you a speech. You, you know, he kind of looked at me. So he's, you better go learn them. So I went back in the trailer and I learned all this big, long ass speech and everything. And I caught Jim going to the bathroom and I went, hey, man, I, they, they gave me all these lines for the show. And he goes, what, 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 what are you talking about? I said, they gave me this big, long speech. And he goes, really? What? I said, here, let me show it to you. OK, he goes, great. Sure. So I read the whole thing <laughs> off. He goes, oh, that's fantastic. You know, and then I went in to the to the to the main writer of the show who I've been friends with, was was with friends with before, and I'm still friends with. And um, and I went up to Jonathan and said, Jonathan, I got the speech out. He goes, oh, Really? Really? Oh, like surprise. And I went, You mean you want to hear it? And he goes, Yeah. And all him and his writers were all sitting around. And I reeled it off, you know, like really confident and everything. And they all went, Man, that's fantastic. I said, Thanks for writing me all these lines. I go, sure, sure. And so basically, I I I I highballed their friggin' their 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 hazing by learning the fig, the part. I went, yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. Come on, I'm ready, you know. So, uh, you know, there were there were there were days. I, I never had a problem on the show. I never was yelled at. I was it's front it's front of a live studio audience, right? Like on a Friday. Correct. Correct. Awesome. Correct. That's just like jazz. I got really natural. Yeah. It and is. you studying I improv? Got- I mean. That's and it's I, like I making really something natural. out of nothing, you know, I got really natural with it. I yeah. could go out there when they would when and, and sometimes when, when they would when we were going through the scenes, they would let us go and improv and we just go throw that stuff back and forth to each other. And then all the crews cracking up and it's not on camera or anything, you know, or else they didn't keep it as far as I know, you know, so we we had some of that. I remember one morning, though, we went in for a table read on like Tuesday and we shot on Friday and and my part came around to my part and something in me that morning made me try to put something into this part and i tried to put some other character in there and it was so sweet because they were all professional actors and i read this line and somebody went oops somebody's acting and 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 i went and i turned red beat red i went oh my god i busted in front of everybody at the table read is horrible (laughs) and they all laughed and patted me on the back and said it's okay it's okay so it was just so embarrassing but it really gave me a lot of character and taught me that sometimes you have to go through really embarrassing things in conversations with people anyhow or in situations like that and i I've learned how to accept that fact that if I'm really, really embarrassed because I st- said something completely stupid or I did something completely that was idiotic, I just go, oh, OK, well, I did it. So, you know, yeah, let it go and not and not go home and cry ab- about it. Or I mean, whatever. that's so fun. How long did that last? Several years, right? Eight years, eight years, eight years. And so you like, had to be in town, right, for those table reads on Tuesdays to record on Fridays? Yeah, I missed one show and I subbed out and I was uh, I subbed it out and I didn't have a line that week. So it was just basically and they didn't shoot the guy. In fact, I got Willie to do it. The guy got Willie and said, you go going to play the drummer this week. Awesome. And um, he threw it back to him. It was sitting in the garage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Of course I have to. And then I had one where I was supposed to go on a. A Delbert McClinton cruise with Teresa James and. And it was all booked, and I and I double check, triple check, quadruple check with the head of the writers, the the production company, uh, producers of the show, the directors of the show, Jim, everybody. We're not shooting that week. We are definitely taking that week off. We're not shooting. We are not shooting that week. Network says we cannot shoot that week. There's no way we we're going to shoot that week. Nobody said yes, we're shooting that week. Everybody said we're definitely not going to shoot this week. You know, get my point. Okay, I go, okay, well, I'm going on this cruise and I'm going to go play with some friends and I'll be back on the following Sunday. We can start. Go. We're shooting that show the next week. You're perfect. Go ahead. Have a great time. Oh, no. I booked yeah. myself on the cruise. A week later, after I bought the ticket spot and everything, uh, they changed their mind and they want to shoot that show. And it was an important show. And I had to call Teresa and tell her the news. And I had to call. And of course, I knew... I knew uh, Delbert and I knew his wife and everything. And they didn't look it did. They didn't look fondly on what I had done by pulling out and going, Oh, he's doing a TV thing instead. But, but, but dig this. I, I still seven years of work, man. I got seven, eight years of work out of this and I got a pension because of it. So, yeah. you know, incredible. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, that's a, it's such an amazing like story, man. It's just, it just, it just speaks to the power of, of relationships and the power of being yeah. in a entertainment city like sunny Los Angeles, that anything can happen and the phone can ring and it could be a life changing moment. Correct. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And you, you, you know, because you're, 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 you're digging into that area as well. Yeah, I swam like, in the, so swam yeah. in the waters. I'm, you know, trying to yeah. figure out, you know, what's next, you know, it's so, it's so fun. I, I would, I'd love it. I'd love it if I could get a, a part of as a grandpa, as a recurring role in a show as a grandpa or something right now, some grouchy old man. And I read several parts recently that I went, even with a Southern accent, there was one with a Southern accent. went, I can nail this. I can yeah, do that. Texas. So easy. With my white hair and my Texas accent, I know I could do this. You yeah, know? we're redoing but- Back to the Future Southern. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. I wouldn't mind that. I, I, I don't mind. I'm not, you know, I'm not afraid or ashamed really to go there on on, on crazy parts at all. So hey, you were yeah. talking to uh, Dom Famularo on a sessions thing and you were uh, there was a thing about a book. I didn't get to hear it all play out, but are you working on an educational book or is it a oh, bio I, biography type thing or? I've been on this idea for, oh God, 15 or more years of starting this shuffle book and about the blues shuffle. And I'm, yes. and I'm, 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 ha- I'm aiming at blues shuffles and what they do and the music that they played. And it, it you know, there's a lot of, there, there's now a lot of stuff out on shuffles and uh, there's a few books out on shuffles. And I know Stanton Moore has something on shuffles and every drummer that teaches or has a, a podcast is going to talk about the shuffle, but this is different because not that theirs don't have character, this is different because this is related to the actual music that you play when you do the shuffle. And um, my friend Adam Gust is coming over here. He's a great drummer. Uh, Los I Angeles love Adam. And he's we went to college oh, together. Wonderful. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah, we both had practice um, rooms next to each other in North Texas State, and we both played in the same band called Random Axis. Holy cow. That's crazy. Isn't that so crazy? He's coming over here, and he's shooting me. He's shooting me playing my different ty- styles of shuffles, and we're going to. I'm going to, and we're going to edit the music, we'll mix the music down and he's going to edit it together and we're putting it up. Uh, it'll be like an online book of me playing these shuffles and I'll have some exercises and I'll talk about where I think they came from. And, you know, there's always people that take away from what you say, no, that's not a double shuffle or that's, that's a Chicago shuffle. And I'm calling them names like double shuffle, swing shuffle, Chicago shuffle, uh, stumble shuffle, uh, Detroit shuffle. Uh, you know, I've given them all names and they're, they're like little chapters or whatever. And I'm, I'm playing, I'm, I cut tracks with some fantastic musicians in the studio way back then. And um, I've got those tracks and I'm playing along with those tracks and he's filming me. Doing that, that is so smart. And I, I got, you know, I got to do something with it. <clears throat> and um, I, I'm, it, it's not like I'm trying to like make a lot of money, but, every, but Dom Falamalero has been after me for years. Through that. He said, you have to, to do this because you know how to play that kind of music and you understand that the shuffle in, in, a, in a pretty clear way that you could explain to a lot of people, you've got to pass this on. So I'm finally getting around to it. Good I'm, man. I'm excited about it. Yeah, That's like so exciting. And that Adam's coming over today because there, there is that, you know, drum magazine video that's floating around and it's really great. You know, where it's like, you've got the shuffle on the snare and you know, you've got the quarter notes on the ride and then the jazz pattern on the ride. And then the, the both hands doing the same thing and leave the first note out of the shuffle. I mean, right. you know, I love all those things. The thing that, that, that it happens for me is making musical choices where try not to overthink it, but it's like choosing which one of those things you use in the, appropriate situation and what is expected good, of the other musicians you know that's what? a good point i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm taking a note on that thank you that's a good point i'm gonna use that <laughs> and you know how gad splashes the hi-hat on two and four i stole that from him yeah. and he plays the butt end yeah, yeah. of the stick on the ride and kind of dampens it so it's just like a you know he's got the double shuffle going on the detuned snare and then he's got the butt end of the stick kind of muting the the ride the symbol, and then he's yeah. got the splash going on the hi-hat that's kind of the one i use a lot. You know, you know, there's four on the floor. There's ba boom ba 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 boom ba ba. There's bam pa 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 bam pa da dum pa ka da dum ka. Then there's the 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 Detroit the do do ka the do do ka the do do ka da. You know, and uh and then then there's just a swing shuffle where you, you know, I mean, there's the, like the, the Chicago shuffle I'm doing. I'm doing it with brushes. Those are I my I could do it like I do my double shuffle, but because I'm from Texas, my disclaimer is. I played what I call a double shuffle uh, in Los Angeles on at eight o'clock on a Friday night and at uh, eight, nine, nine, eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night on that same night, there's a guy from Louisiana in Detroit playing what he calls 
a double shuffle or a right. Chicago shuffle, or whatever. It said, you know, everybody's got their interpretation of it, you know. So I'm giving my interpretation of it and whether it gets uh, shut down in any way, it doesn't matter to me. I just, it, because, I mean, I watch other people's uh, instructional videos and I go, mm, oh, you do it that way. You know, not egotistically, yeah. just uh, translation, you know. Uh, well, it's great that you play everybody. music that there that is triplet based because let's face it, popular music is gone duple. Uh, Ed Sof used to call yeah. me duple boy because he was like, you know, is it, you know, there's 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 two walks of life. There's if you're walking to a straight eighth, you're walking to a triplet subdivision, which is obviously straight from Africa, and then you have the drunk Correct. Texas glag 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 glog glog glag glag glog glog that yeah. that thing, <laughs> you know, the the yeah. skiffle. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, but there just isn't a lot of uh, triplet based music on the radio. You know, I mean, we used to have reeling in the years. What would you call it? I call that a Chardonnay shuffle because now That's Steely Dan line. is like yacht rock. So I That's call it a, a Chardonnay good. shuffle. Oh, I, I, you, you got that's wonderful. I love that <laughs> Chardonnay shuffle. So so the so the second shuffle book I do, you and I do it together and we give them all some crazy names. I love oh, I'd love I, that would be so fun naming these things. Well, I know Adam's coming over, man. You give me 80 minutes of your time. It was so overdue. It's so amazing to catch up on a public forum. And I can't wait to join you again. You made me one mean uh cup of french press coffee about nine years ago oh, so we're overdue right. well, man well you it, next time you come to town let me know and we'll do the coffee thing again and sit around my patio or we'll go somewhere nearby and eat or whatever and hang out and i'd love to do that i'd love to spend more time with you and um i love your playing and your energy and i everything i see you do i'm just going man you're on fire there he is that's rich he's at it man <laughs> you know he doesn't you, you're not halfway you know did you play on the CMAs? Uh, you, you weren't in this, the house band, were you? No, I didn't CMAs. do the house band, but I played with Al Dean. We did. Oh, my God. We've been yeah. doing so much. We did the I Heard. We did the CMAs. We did the CMTs. Yeah, yeah. We did Good Morning America. And now we have a month off and then we fire up for our tour. And let's face it, after the zombie apocalypse, any kind of touring is just amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm going to New York next week for three dates with the Blues Brothers and then nice. to Memphis for some some blues uh, music award or oh, some uh, international blues challenge business and show my face as a producer, you know, oh, I love and, it. and shake hands and do all that stuff. That has to be such a fun business. show to play. Come and do it. Come on. Oh, it's it, it, the energy of the, the blues brother show. It starts at with the soul finger. That's, that's where it starts. Just the, pumping. The second shows. Yeah. The second show is like, a, you know, this big sax, you know, all of those riffs and everything. And then, and then we stop and we, we stop and we go into a shuffle and they come out and they sing and they do their, with the hats on and they do their dancing and they're all like posturing. And, and the whole show is just crazy. And it doesn't matter whether those guys are on it or not, because they're not professional singers or musicians. It doesn't matter. Their energy and their fervor is so out there that it just, it, it takes over. Everybody loves the show. I've invited musician friends of mine to the show that I thought uh, it's not that tight musically. And, and they leave. They're going, are you kidding me? That's the most fun I've had in a while. You know? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I get to do that next week. So that's incredible. Cool. I'm so excited yeah, for you, man. Well, it's yeah. so great to see your smiling face and uh, we really appreciate your time and talent, man. Rich, I love you and I love what you do, man. And don't stop it. And uh, I'm around here. You need me for anything. Call me and, and let's get together and have that coffee. Let's do it. Thank you so much, brother. And hey, to all the listeners out there, we appreciate your time and talent. We appreciate you listening. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Tell a friend. It helps people find the podcast much faster. And that's what we're into, man. Uh, spreading uh, love and all the good stuff through uh, talking about all things music, motivation, and success. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Tony, thanks, man. Peace, bro. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe. Great and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.